Maurice, Martha, Louis, Jenny, and Betty Sodder, known to their parents and siblings as loving additions to their large family, were sweet and innocent children of 1940s West Virginia. Their carefree benevolence and youthful wonder were cut short by unexplainable, unsolved disappearances on Christmas Eve 1945, leaving all who knew them across the United States and West Virginia as a whole, grasping for answers in a sea of evidence that drowned us all in doubt. As I hope to provide more substantial reasoning built upon observable evidence and situational analysis, this is an examination of the Sodder children disappearance and the confounding mystery along State Route 19. This is Cold Case Detective. <laughs> The Sodder family legacy began in Tula, Sardina, Italy, with the birth of Giorgio Sodu in 1895. Through 13 years of apparent turmoil and unknown misfortune, Giorgio finally immigrated to the United States as a teenager in 1908. He ventured to Ellis Island with his older brother and safely entered his new home country, letting go of his Italian roots and going by the name George Sodder thereafter. George's older brother immediately turned around back to Europe once he saw his younger siblings officially enter the States, and George Sodder was free at last from the troubles of Tula. In all of the preceding years spent in the United States of America, George kept his homeland secrets close to his heart, never discussing the exact motivations that pushed him out of Italy and across the pond. After combing the East Coast for employment, George eventually wandered into the Rust Belt and picked up railroad work in Pennsylvania, acting as a runner of sorts, delivering water, materials, and other goods to his fellow laborers. He saved up money over a few years of similar duties and later obtained a full-time gig as a driver down in Smithers, West Virginia, exploring the Appalachian countryside as he ventured into adulthood. Gaining vital experience as a heavy-duty driver George turned his dedication into a business, starting his own trucking company that transported dirt between construction sites across Appalachia. This then transformed into hauling coal from the local mines around West Virginia mountains, and soon George garnered local respect to the Sodder name. He soon after met his future wife, Jenny Cipriani, a shopkeeper's daughter, who had also immigrated to the US from Italy during her own youth. The two married, and their flourishing family charted course in Fayetteville, West Virginia. Fayetteville brought the newlywed couple plenty of joy. The town itself was an Italian immigrant community with plenty of Italian businesses and slices of Italian life. George located the family home in a two-story house, framed with timber, a couple of miles north of the city limits. By the time the Rolling Twenties were underway, Jenny gave birth to little John Sodder, the first of what would be 10 children in 1923. As more kids were born, George saw his trucking business take off with unparalleled success for such a small town. The Sodder family grew in both size and in prosperity, quickly transforming into one of the most respected middle-class families around, in the words of one of the locals. Newly born kids kept coming as the 1920s gave way to the depression in the 1930s. Nevertheless, the Sodder family kept kicking. Through economic downturns and social unrest across the country, George and Jenny didn't bat an eye. In fact, the only detriment to the Sodder's reputation was George's strong-willed nature and unbreakable opinion on controversial matters. His adamant stance on condescending for some local folks, in particular his criticisms of Benito Mussolini, fractured a few relationships with the Italian-rooted community despite all of the positives and negatives associated with the Sodder family. George and Jenny, all in all, welcomed 10 children into the world, five boys and five girls. John, Joseph, Marian, George Jr., Maurice, Martha, Louis, Jenny, Irene, Betty, and finally Sylvia in 1943. They made such a large clan work for a two-story home in a low-key country lifestyle. 
even the age gaps and generational differences between the children. They all got along, bringing varying personalities and unique interests to the dinner table every night. The Sodder children never failed to impress their parents, their peers, and their teachers. If one were to ask anyone in the West Virginia town what kind of legacy the Sodders would leave behind, it would have been one of perseverance, positive change, and endless potential sprouting from those children. Instead, tragedy crept up on the misfortunate souls living in that two-story timber house of possibility, just as the holiday season hit its peak in 1945. On April 28, 1945, Benito Mussolini is executed in Italy by Italian forces, the beginning of the end of his fascist regime. Meanwhile, in the Italian immigrant community of Fayetteville, West Virginia, George Sodder continues to harshly criticize the dictator, leaving other Italian-Americans offended and displeased. Six months later, in October of 1945, an unidentified life insurance salesman rings the doorbell to the Sodder household and attempts to persuade George to buy insurance. George quickly dismisses the salesman, and the insurance expert loses his cool. He screams at George, saying the Sodder home would go up in smoke, and your children are going to be destroyed. He continues on explaining this threat originates from the dirty remarks you will be making about Mussolini. Not long after the October salesman incident, another male individual visits the Sodder residence with suspicious intentions. This visitor claims to be looking for general work when acknowledged by George and walks the Sodder patriarch behind his house. In the back, the visitor points to two local fuse boxes and claims that they will cause a fire someday. George is confused but not worried as the electrical company had recently rewired the house and claimed the result to be safe and secure. During the first few weeks of December 1945, the older Sodder brothers notice an out of place car parked along the main road crossing through downtown, apparently observing the younger Sodder siblings as they journeyed home from school each afternoon. On Christmas Eve 1945, the Sodder family celebrates the holidays like any family would. The eldest daughter, Marian, working at a local dime store, brings home extra little toys for her younger sisters, Martha, Jenny, and Betty. Their excitement from the surprise leads to a later bedtime being arranged by Mrs. Sodder, and at 10pm, she instructs two of the boys, Maurice and Louis, to keep an eye out on their sisters, as long as they tend to the farm animals before sleeping themselves. They agree, and the children entertain themselves later into the evening than usual. Meanwhile, George, George Jr., John, and Sylvia were sleeping, followed soon by Mrs. Sodder herself. Just after midnight, around 12.30 a.m., the telephone rings, and Mrs. Sodder wakes up to answer it. On the other line is an unrecognizable female voice. She asks for someone who doesn't exist in the mind of Mrs. Sodder, who can hear muffled laughter and what sounds like clinking glasses in the background of the phone call. Mrs. Sodder tells the female that she must have the wrong number, and is met by a weird laugh by the woman, as Mrs. Sodder would later describe it. On her way back to bed, she notices the living room lights were left on, along with the curtains kept undrawn, thinking it to be unusual for the normally disciplined children to have left the house in such a state. Mrs. Sodder shrugs it off as Marian sleeps on the couch, and she returns to bed. A mere 30 minutes later, at 1am, the sound of something hitting the roof of the home echoes inside with a bang, preceded by a rolling noise. Once again, it's Mrs. Sodder who wakes up to investigate. However, she is only met with silence and goes back to sleep once more. Another half hour goes by, and at around 1.30am, Mrs. Sodder awakens for a third time. She immediately smells smoke and bolts out of bed. In the hallway, she sees George's office engulfed by flames, a fire growing near the telephone wires and fuse box. Wasting no time, Jenny wakes her father up, who alerts his eldest sons too. Over the next few minutes, George, his wife, his daughter Marian, his sons John, George Jr., and the toddler Sylvia all escape alive. They attempt to call up to the remaining children upstairs asleep in the attic, but are unable to climb the burning stairs and rescue them personally. The immediate after effect brings forth both chaos and panic. Marian first tries to use the family phone inside of the ground level of the home to call emergency services, but finds the phone unusable. 
Thus she runs over to the neighbors to use their telephone and alert the fire department. Simultaneously, a driver from a nearby road spots the blaze across the way and heads to a tavern to call the fire department himself. It's later understood the driver never contacts a 911 operator, again probably due to a broken phone. Instead, either a third party observer of the fire or the Sodder's neighbor rushes into the town square and contacts emergency services via a phone in downtown Fayetteville. Meanwhile, every improvised plan the Sodder family concocts fails due to unfortunate circumstances. First, George climbs the house barefoot and breaks an attic window, ignoring the cuts and blood drawn from the process. However, he cannot climb inside without the boost of a ladder. Yet, in a bizarre twist, the ladder usually positioned against the home is nowhere in the vicinity, despite a vigorous search by George and the two older boys. Next, the exuberant Sodder men plot to utilize their water barrel to put out some of the flames inside the home, but discover the water frozen solid and useless. Finally, George goes to pull his work trucks up alongside the siding to the house and climb them instead, but the engines won't ignite and the vehicles can't start. Over the next 45 minutes into the early morning hours of Christmas Day, the Sodder family helplessly watches their loving home burn to ashes, believing the rest of their children to be trapped inside certainly perishing in the blaze. The following day, the fire department finally arrives on the scene. They blame their slow response time on a lack of employees due to the effects of war and the overnight fire chief's inability to drive the fire truck. By 10 a.m. on Christmas 1945, the fire has simmered down and the firefighters comb through the burn zone. They reportedly find no bones, yet still claim the lost children to be dead. Conflicting stories report that the firefighters find remnants of bones and organs that morning, but it's never confirmed and professionals later state their 10 a.m. search lacks sufficiency. Regardless, the firefighters complete their search and conclude the Sodder children's bodies were completely burned, the fire being hot enough to rid the scene of any remains, the tragedy wiping away the Sodder family's years of legacy building. However, the living members are already beginning to question the official findings of the fire's conclusion, a spark of curiosity into the deceased children's actual fate, and the possibility they simply disappeared. As the days, months, and years trickled by, the living Sodder family members grew more and more suspicious of the entire investigation into the house fire. Not only were they concerned with the little details that popped out from their normal daily routine, but of the official findings of the fire department itself, and the seemingly lack of efforts put forth to reach an appropriate conclusion. In the midst of the family's desperate search for a clearer resolution, the Sodders hired private detective C.C. Tinsley of Gawley Bridge, West Virginia, to investigate the fire and impending case files. Tinsley worked outside of the scope of law enforcement and emergency personnel digging up further information that only clouded the situation from truth. However, one piece of evidence that Tinsley learned sticks out a little more than the rest, and while it doesn't pinpoint any sort of satisfying conclusion, it acts more like an eliminator, telling us what should and should not be considered in a vat of inconclusivity. During Tinsley's sweep of Fayetteville to pick up whispers and rumors swirling around the town, he heard one repeated piece of gossip on several occasions about Fire Chief F.J. Morris actually discovering a human heart in the aftermath of the Sodder House fire. Despite telling the family, they found zero remains. The rumors stated Morris had taken the heart himself, wrapped it up, and hid it in a metal container buried somewhere around West Virginia. Tinsley pursued the tip and learned that Morris had supposedly confessed to a local religious figure George Sodder himself approached the minister who confirmed Morris's confession. When George and Tinsley interviewed Chief Morris, they caught him in his lie, and Morris caved to his guilt. He took both men to the burial spot of the metal box and showed them the heart he found back in 1945. The twist came in the following days when the old heart was taken to a West Virginian funeral director. The funeral director inspected the heart and actually found that it wasn't a heart at all. Rather, it was beef liver that had zero scarring or burn damage. Meaning wherever Chief Morris got the organ, it wasn't from ground zero on the Sodder property. Following the beef liver scam, 
More gossip spread throughout the area, claiming Morris admitted using the organs to fake out the Sodder family and lead them to believe their children did indeed die in the fire, matching his unit's initial report. So while the buried tin can heart had no physical importance to the discovery of the missing Sodder children, it did reveal one key factor in the grand scheme of things, that the fire department's insistence that the kids completely burned in the fire was a guess at best and they were willing to literally fake a body part to avoid further conspiracy, suspicion, and their own lack of faith. It puts a massive question mark over the heads of those who are trusted to do their due diligence in solving the fates of the five children left in the burning home. If the fire chief wasn't sure the kids were actually killed in the fire, then how can anyone else be certain, let alone the actual living relatives? It forces us to ask the question about who else might know something or worse be involved in what could be more than an accidental fire, but a rage-filled arson with the intent to kill, or even stranger, kidnapped five innocent beings. Remember the insurance salesman who threatened George Sodder after hearing about his Mussolini comments a couple of months before the fire? He was one of the first suspicious figures singled out by private detective C.C. Tinsley. Apparently, the still unidentified man was on the coroner's jury that labelled the Sodder house fire as an official accident. This can easily be dismissed as a circumstantial coincidence, but given the harsh nature of the salesman's demeanour and unnecessary harassment of George Sodder, it's worth considering him as a shadowy player in a similar vein, many followers of the case have pointed out to other potential Italian-related subjects as potential suspects. Blanket questions have been raised about the Italian Mafia and connections George may have had throughout his growing business relationships in the years leading up to Christmas of 1945. George repeatedly denied these allegations, yet still never clarified the nature of his initial immigration to the United States. People speculate he and his brother fled their home country to run away from a family dispute. Others believe the Sora family owed the Italian Mafia money. From a more realistic viewpoint, George's Mussolini rants could have incited anger with the wrong groups of Mussolini sympathizers, inciting violence from men capable of undercover malice. That's the other line of Italian-related assumptions, the Mussolini supporters were notified of a prominent businessman's distaste and decide to retaliate. In criticism of this theory, many pro-Mussolini and pro-fascist battalions would make it quite known when and where they struck with political statements, and most likely wouldn't have left a crime scene so bare of the signatures. If a potential culprit did attack the Sodders for political reasons, they did so alone and privately. Another specific figure thought to be involved with the conflagration was a petty thief seen by the Sodders' neighbours, slinking around their property around the 1945 holiday season, stealing block and tackle from the vicinity. Investigators identified the man and tracked him down for questioning. The thief admitted to stealing the block and tackle, explaining he cut the phone lines, thinking it was a power line. Sadly, no permanent record of this thief's identity was ever kept and any further sleuthing into the man's background cannot be conducted. It's another example of circumstantial coincidence, but considering the vagueness of the results, it must be fully appreciated. The biggest theory revolving around the Sodder children tragedy questions if Maurice, Martha, Louis, Jenny and Betty died at all. Instead of perishing in the fire, a lot of amateur investigators wonder if the five children were kidnapped either reaching a different fate or eventually escaping and entering a completely different world in which they were raised. The mother, Jenny Sodder, was the first and most prominent supporter of this theory. She never fully believed that her children's entire bodies could be completely destroyed in the fire, referencing two things. First, that she recognized many household appliances and personal belongings in the wreckage, not fully burned. Second, Mrs. Sodder remembered a recent story in the local paper about a similar house fire not too far away from her home, in which seven people died, yet all seven left behind skeletal remains. Too curious to sit by the wayside, Jenny took animal bone fragments and burned them for extended periods of time. Despite this, none of the bones burned completely to ash. 
To back up her experiments, Mrs. Sodder then referred a local crematorium worker to her findings. The employee confirmed that human bones will remain in the aftermath of a fire, even after burning at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, or 1,090 degrees Celsius for two hours. This is both a longer duration and a much hotter temperature than the Sodder House fire could have sustained. So if the bodies couldn't have been burned all the way through, yet there were zero remains discovered, then where did the children go? Many folks have come out with potential sodded sightings over the past couple of years, claiming the children to still be alive, or at least at the time of their potential spotting. One of the first sightings were made by George Sodder, the father himself. In 1949, he was reading a newspaper with pictures of a ballet dancer in New York City. One of the young female members bore a striking resemblance to Betty, one of his missing daughters. Wasting little time, George drove over state lines and visited the little girl's school to be absolutely sure. However, the school blocked George from entering the classroom to see her face. Despite his repeated demands and explanation of the bizarre circumstances, Three years later, with little developments, the Sodder family posted a couple of billboards along state routes in West Virginia, displaying the pictures of their five unaccounted for children. Not long after, further reports of eyewitnesses claimed to have seen some of the children filtered into authorities. The first major account came from a Charleston hotel operator, Ida Crutchfield, not even a week later. She said that on an unknown date from a previous year, she hosted four adults of Italian extraction that came into the hotel around midnight with five young children, matching the ages and genders of the Sodder youngsters. Ida said she attempted to speak to the children, but one of the men looked at me in a hostile manner. He turned around and began talking rapidly in Italian. Immediately, the whole party stopped talking to me. She went on saying the entire group left early the next day. The claim was never strongly considered by law enforcement, who felt she had waited too long to come forward with information. Despite knowing what the Sodder children looked like five years prior to her claim. In between other small-scale sightings, George Sodder continued his own mission in finding his sons and daughters, traveling all over the country to interview tipsters. One St. Louis woman thought she saw Martha Sodder being held in a local convent, Another person was in a Texas bar one night when they heard two other patrons making incriminating statements about a Christmas Eve house fire in West Virginia from years prior. Even George's own family were suspects in his eyes when a relative on Jenny Sodder's side had kids in Florida that were rumored to look a lot like George's offspring. He had to visit them in person just to officially clear them in his own Rolodex of suspicions. George's biggest investigation took him to Texas in 1967, when an unidentified woman wrote to the Sodders, saying their missing son, Louis Sodder, had given up his true identity while drunk one night, and might be living with his other missing brother, Maurice, somewhere out in Texas. When George and his son-in-law, Grover Paxton, were unable to find this woman, they had police help them find the two men from her story. These men repeatedly denied being the Sodder children and left George once again empty-handed. Grover later told followers of the case that these two men's denials haunted George to his grave, who was less than certain they weren't his own children. Of all the sightings and testimonies put out by strangers, 1967 produced the most tangible evidence of the Sodder children's survival any family member has ever received, before or since. Jenny Sodder was checking the mail one day when she received a letter addressed specifically to her, postmarked from Central City, Kentucky. There was no return address or any other clues. When she opened it, Jenny found a photo of a young gentleman, probably in his late 20s or early 30s, his facial features matching missing Sodder boy Louis, who would have been about that age had he survived. When she turned the photo over, Jenny found the following inscription, Louis Sodder, I love brother Frankie, Lil Boys, A90132, or 35. Sparked by a newfound hope, the Sodder family hired a second private detective to go to Central City and investigate the letter's origin. But the PI left and never came back to Fayetteville, completely ghosting the Sodder family, as they were unable to reach him after his departure. This is one of the most curious aspects to the entire case, 
when the family finally receives a massive tip in the mail and has a chance to track down the sender, their investigator disappears and is never heard from again. It's the most suspicious theory alive today that the photo is truly depicting Louis, who was sending a desperate clue. Maybe still under duress, and the man who was sent to find him met the same trouble and perished. There will never be a way to verify who is looking into the camera lens, but rest assured, it captured the heart of the Sodder family after the fact. They added the photo to the highway billboards and put one up on the mantle at their new home. Two years after the mystery of the unknown photograph, George Sodder passed away in 1969, ending a lot of the hands-on sleuthing performed by the family themselves. The sightings and theories seemed to die down as well, leaving the Sodders without much more hope than they had back in the winter of 1945. The remaining theories are pretty evenly split between the children having perished in the fire and having been taken elsewhere. The polarity of each can both be argued and neither one seems to have much more traction than the other. Experts and reporters have given their fair share of opinions and findings on the case, and even when they come out and say the Sodder children most likely died that Christmas Eve night, they still open the door of possibilities, saying there would be no surprise or shock if one day we discover those five kids were still alive at the start of the new year in 1946. Before we divulge our hypothesis of Maurice, Martha, Louis, Jenny, and Betty Sodder's unsolved disappearances, we want to make known our conclusions presented in Cold Case Detective are purely logical speculation based on evidence, circumstance, and factual subtext. We are only privy to the same information presented in each video, and we do not attempt to promise certainty or an expert guarantee on the findings we reach in closing. We simply observe research and report. In terms of what exactly happened on Christmas Eve 1945, we believe the fire started by that of an arson, intentional or born of malicious origins. The fire department's claim that an electrical problem had caused the fire doesn't make sense when one considers the Sodder's Christmas lights had remained lit and functioning during the early stages of the fire. Had the flames resulted from faulty wiring like the coroner's jury stated, the power in the house would have gone out and external lighting should not have remained on. There were also clues that a third party was intentionally sabotaging the Sodder's chances of accessing the attic after the fire had started. Considering the ladder that usually rested against the home was lying at the bottom of an embankment, about 75 feet away from the property, a bus driver that had driven past the Sodder residence that night also saw two figures throwing balls of fire at the house at an undetermined time. After the snow melted in the spring of 1946, Sylvia Sodder retrieved a hardened rubber ball-like object in the brush on the Sodder property, shaped like a pineapple bomb or hand grenade. Remember, Jenny Sodder heard a thump on the roof of the house right before the smoke smell entered the premises, followed by a rolling noise similar to that of a ball rolling down a slanted roof. All things considered, there was too much evidence left at the scene to deny the idea of an arson. In terms of the death of the five Sodder children, we believe they were not killed by the flames and somehow escaped the attic before their demise. In addition to the previous studies and testimonies that there were no bones or remains found in the ash, there was actually a second excavation in 1949 that found nothing to suggest the alternative. In August of that year, Washington DC pathologist Oscar Hunter organized a much more detailed excavation and in their findings, they pulled out a dictionary, a few coins, and human vertebrae. However, when the bones were inspected by a Smithsonian specialist, Marshall T. Newman, he found they were lumbar vertebrae belonging to a single individual of between 16 and 22 years of age. The oldest missing child was Maurice, 14 at the time, and determined to not have been the bearer of these specific bones. Newman also found the bones to have had no exposure to heat, meaning they were already in the dirt hauled into the site post house fire. Experts theorized they came from a cemetery near Mount Hope in West Virginia and were sent back to the family in December 1949, never to be seen again. 
Thus, if two professional excavations took place and never found one shred of physical remains of buried victims, it's highly unlikely the children's bodies burned with the rest of the belongings. Finally, in terms of the actual fate of the sort of children, it's safe to assume the rest of the family was right in thinking they were kidnapped or taken against their will, whether it be by gangsters or unhappy Italian-American compatriots. As far-fetched as it sounds, the remaining Sodder siblings believed the Sicilian Mafia was extorting money from their father and, after little compliance, took five of his children. This makes sense, explaining George's utter silence about his hidden childhood and darkened flee from Italy. The kidnapper knew whoever was planning the arson and promised the safety of the children stuck up in the attic. Remembering the state of the house on Christmas Eve, with the lights turned on, the curtains opened, and the status of the kids upstairs never confirmed by Mrs. Sodder herself, when midnight drew nearer. There is no evidence to refute the idea of a stranger inside the home, or the removal of those five children. They might have been taken to Italy, aware the rest of their family would be in danger back in the US if they ever tried contacting them again. Reasoning why they were silent for so many years post-tragedy, in regards to the supposed photo of Louis Sodder received in 1967, one major clue supports this theory. The numbers scribbled on the back of the paper, A90132 or 35, could pertain to postal codes. 90132 is in Sri Lanka and most likely misprinted. However, if you substitute 32 with the 35 zip code 90135, this is located in Italy. Could it be Louis giving vague hints to his current whereabouts? Taking everything into account, it cannot be ignored. The sort of children, if alive, wouldn't go completely unnoticed, and this is probably the best proof of survival. Maybe one day, someone will travel to these locations with a better method in finding the man in the central city mystery portrait. Regardless, the tragedy endured by George, Jenny, and the living Sodder youngsters was unlike any other West Virginia small town had ever seen at that time. Those five children had their entire lives ahead of them, full of untapped potential. Their legacy was only beginning to flourish, ripened under instructive parenting and successful tutelage from George and Jenny. Beloved by most of the community and on the way to forging their own paths of success, Maurice, Martha, Louis, Jenny, and Betty Sodder were the future not just in their family, but in Fayetteville and America at large. Whether or not they died or disappeared is second to the fact that whatever happened is unfair, unjust, and will hopefully serve as a reminder to everyone that life is a precious, sacred thing, only ever seconds away from being extinguished. As of today, Sylvia Sodder Paxton is the only surviving member of the original Sodder clan, her faith in finding her lost siblings, or at least determining their official fate, is as strong as ever. Maybe with the resurgence in this case, her wishes can be brought to light, the dying hopes of the rest of the family fulfilled with resilience and determination. Until then, we continue to seek answers for those five souls left in the dark on Christmas Eve 1945, one day solving the Sodder children's disappearance, and the flames of mystery that burned more than just a house but a loving, lively pedigree. This has been Cold Case Detective.